Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have on Janice Grady for part three of the interview we've been doing. Janice, welcome to the show. Hi Jeff, thank you for having me. Janice, your book, Commodore's Messenger, is so exciting, I'm reading it. It's available on Amazon. I urge our listeners who haven't ordered it to order it, read it. It's a fascinating read of Scientology history. And on today's show, we're going to start in about April 1969. You're on the flagship Apollo as a Commodore's Messenger organization, Messenger for L. Ron Hubbard. We didn't have the Messenger organization yet. Really? Yeah, it was just the four messengers. So what were you called, Messengers? Commodore's Messengers. Well, when did the Commodore's Messenger organization actually come into existence? Probably 74. Now, see, this is an interesting bit of history. So you were just messengers. Yes. And then at some point, Mr. Hubbard decides to make the messengers an organization within Scientology. Right, and that's what I covered before because adults kept trying to tell us what to do and we would keep getting in trouble. Like we might be down the dock having a potato fight with the U.S. Navy and one of our execs walks by and reports back that we're throwing potatoes at a Navy ship. And so, <laughs> so we all get pulled back aboard and restricted to the ship. Hubbard always thought we were good PR with the Navy. And he thought it was funny. That, where, that would be uh, funny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, some, some Scientologists aren't funny at all. Janice, when you get in a potato fight with the U.S. Navy, is it just good fun? You're throwing potatoes at the ship? Yeah, we, yeah we're walking by and they start throwing potatoes at us to get our attention. So we're throwing <laughs> potatoes back at them. You know, and their admiral comes by and they're signaling us to stop throwing potatoes. So we, the admiral goes back aboard and then as soon as he leaves, the potatoes start going back and forth. And then Captain Bill comes by and sees us. So he goes back to the ship and the next thing you know, we're being called back and we're in ethics trouble. You know, and then of course <laughs> I bring that up to Hubbard that we're in trouble for having a potato fight. And uh, he, he thought it was good PR. I think it would be really funny. It's kind of shows you guys some fun on the ship, but, but Captain Bill Robertson was more serious, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah. What was he like? He was a good guy. He had fun moments and he he had serious moments, but in general, he always looked after his crew. He did, and he was very good on his job. Switching topics now. Your mother, Yvonne Gillum, she is over in Los Angeles. What's she doing in Los Angeles in 1969? Well, she left the ship in 1968 um, when the Class 8s were all sent out to the various SEAL organizations. And she f finished the Class 8 course and she was sent out with them to AOLA and was the uh, case supervisor there. And at one point she was the commanding officer there. She, While she was at the AO, she was dealing with the celebrities there and kept a file on the different ones and would just keep track of them and help them on whatever they needed. And she realized this is a missing function within any organization is someone to hold the hands of the celebrities and help them through as they needed and help them build up their confidence to go out and do auditions for various jobs and stuff like that. So when she was being replaced as the commanding officer of AOLA, she wrote to Hubbard and asked permission to set up something like a booking office where she could then follow through with each of the celebrities and get them booked into the different organizations and keep track of them so they didn't fall off lines. And that's when Hubbard had a meeting and he agreed with that and she was sent off to set up a booking office that she then turned into Celebrity Center. Now that's interesting. Now to, to go back a little just for New Time Scientology watchers, when you say AOLA, what does that mean? That's the advanced organization in Los Angeles. That's where one would go and do their upper levels of Scientology processing. There's actually many different organizations in Scientology. 
Correct. And, and what is the job of an organization in Scientology? Each organization is supposed to get new people into Scientology and get them trained on very basic Scientology uh, training and auditing. And then it's their job as they move people through the Scientology bridge, it's their job to then feed to the Sea Org organizations for higher training or higher auditing. So as you're going up the bridge, you go to different organizations for each part of the bridge. Correct. And your mother, being a Class 8 auditor, which is a high-ranking auditor, would work at the advanced organization where the OT levels are delivered. Right. That was the highest class auditor at that time. Janice, I think it's very perceptive of your mother, Yvonne, to realize that celebrities have special needs, not just in Scientology, but in their careers. And right. So Scientology Celebrity Center starts as kind of a, a booking agency. Yes, but it's a booking agency within the Scientology organizations. Janice, if I understand it then, it was just easier for your mother, Yvonne, to put the celebrities into a different organization where she could handle their training and processing. Yes, because then she didn't have to depend on other organizations that are trying to get their stats up every Thursday at 2 o'clock, you know, and so people get ignored. So she wanted to handhold some of these celebrities herself, so she recruited her own auditors to come and audit for her, her own supervisor she trained, and she set up her own organization to service celebrities she also worked with the individual celebrities doing different drills with them before they went for auditions to make sure they felt confident when they went in there for the audition. And I think that's part of the appeal of early Celebrity Center and even, you know, as it continued on, is it could help a celebrity bring order to their work ethic. Right. I was never at Celebrity Center until 1973 was the first time I went, to, I went to the U.S. and to Los Angeles and saw Celebrity Center. So it had already been in existence for four years by the time I'd gone there. Now, this 73 trip, this was, you mentioned in our last interview, was, was this when L. Ron Hubbard and Mary Sue were living in Culver City? No, no. 1973 was when um, L. Ron Hubbard was in New York, and we were in uh, Portugal at that time on the ship. The messengers had been in Morocco with Hubbard and Mary Sue, and then in December of 72, he left and he ended up going to New York, and then we closed down and we moved over to where the ship was in Lisbon, and we remained in Lisbon and sailed, you know, up and down the coast of Portugal while Hubbard was in New York until September of 1973. So while he was gone, Mom had come to the ship for a short period, and we discussed with her us taking a leave of absence because we'd been on the ship since 1968 and never had a leave of absence. She then, when she went back to the U.S., she arranged with Dad to pay for us to fly from Lisbon to Los Angeles to visit her and then Phoenix to visit him. And so that was my first time off the ship, you know, and away from that whole setup it was, um, yeah, May 1973. Is that when you, you and your uh, brother and sister and mom took the trip down to Mexico and did horseback riding? No, um, I never took a leave of absence with my brother, so the family was never together again with, with all of us together. Um, but when we went down to Mexico, that was 1974, it was my sister and I. Okay, you know, I say that because there's pictures online and one reason I like to do my shows is to, to allow people to see what was happening in context when the pictures were taken. Because Scientology history, the, the, the church does not have an official history. There's not okay. an official, you know, for example, there's not, it has a sanitized history. There's not even a, by, an official biography of L. Ron Hubbard. And this is why I really so appreciate you and other Sea Org members, other people in, in Scientology, giving the timeline and the, you know, actually what was going on. So when L. Ron Hubbard is in New York, for example, that's when he writes Program Snow White. Correct. And he's living in that apartment in Queens, New York with Jim Dinkalsi and one other fellow. 
why is he in New York, by the way? Well, you know, after he left Morocco and went to Lisbon, there was he couldn't go on the ship because the ship was still under refit. And so that at that point, he was like, well, what am I going to do? And that's when he decided he would go to New York. So he lives in an apartment. Where, where does Mary Sue go? Mary Sue, a house was rented for her in, um, out just like in the outskirts of Lisbon. It's a little suburb of Lisbon type of thing. House was rented for her, and she stayed there. And then when the ship was done with the renovation, she came back aboard. Okay, then that, that helps me to understand. So it's just the ship's being refit, which is yeah. a very time-consuming process. Now, in the meantime, your mother, Yvonne, is growing Celebrity Center to be, isn't it the biggest organization in the church at that time, or doesn't it become that way? Yeah, it does, with over 200 staff. 200 staff? Yep. That's a big organization. She's oh, command- it is huge. <laughs> From what I've read, this comes to the attention of Elrond Hubbard that your mother is making serious money, and she has a lot of celebrities and influence. Well, I wouldn't say she was making serious money, but she had a good organization going, and it was expanding on a steady basis. She had good staff that, you know, they were there for her because she cared for them. And uh, she made executives. At one point, a lot of the executives in the various different Los Angeles organizations all came from Celebrity Center. Really? They were, they'd all been trained by her. I remember looking at that one time going, wow. And she would, uh, you know, on the front, she would, oh, you know, it's part of helping everybody out. But it wore on her that she'd train someone and then they'd get taken and put in another organization. Now, this is something that, that New Time Scientology watchers may not know. The organizations within Scientology, you could call them divisions if you want, but they're organizations. They compete with each other for personnel and for paying customers, correct? Yes. So the Celebrity Center becomes a very attractive target for organizations that are, are not doing as well to take well-trained auditors and to also take paying publics. And Correct. How does anyone in Scientology get air cover to protect themselves from that happening? <laughs> my mother's air cover, I would have to say, would be uh, myself and my sister. As Commodore's messengers, if she ran into trouble with the Guardian's office, uh, she would write a daily report to Hubbard, the Commodore, and she would mail it to Terry or I and ask us to put it in with the daily reports from the crew that go into the Commodore. And that's how he would find out that she's having trouble with the GO. They're trying to cut her finances and stop her going out on her tours and that type of thing. So it's nice that your mom has two daughters with serious horsepower in the church. Correct. And that you could take care of mom. And that's very interesting because what it says to me, even though there wasn't a formal CMO yet, you and your sister had a lot of power as messengers. Right, and but I don't think we recognized the power that we had. To us, it was just a job. If mom needed help, yeah. I, if anybody asked me, you know, hey, can you get this to Hubbard? I, you know, there's an injustice. I, I would send it in. But see, this is the power I'm talking about. You have access to L. Ron Hubbard in a way that almost nobody in the church does. Correct. Because you, and this is maybe, this gets into our story later when we'll talk about David Miscavige. Access to Hubbard was probably the most coveted thing in the church because he's the man. Right. Janice, I've read on Scientopedia, which has a really good entry on your mother, Yvonne Gilliam Gench, that Jane Kember of the Guardian's office walks into her office at Celebrity Center here in, here in Hollywood, and it's a beautiful off art. Some of your family's furniture is there. I mean, it's just beautiful pieces. And Jane Kember gets furious, and she thinks your, mom's, your mom is a dilettante. Did your mother become enemies with Jane Kember, or was the Guardian's office opposed to the Celebrity Center? What were the politics? You know, it's interesting because Jane and my mother... Um, actually twinned on the St. Hill Special Briefing course back in 1962. Uh, there's a photograph of them that with Hubbard in the photograph as they're doing TRs or something like that. So they knew each other well. And 
you know, my mom was always very friendly with everybody, and she didn't hold on to grudges or anything like that. But she, she constantly felt that the Guardian's office was trying to stop her expansion. They didn't like her visiting with government officials, they, you know, talking to senators, talking to city mayors. She had a project going where she was going around and doing different different activities that helped cities out and things like that. And they were giving her keys to the cities for the activities that she was doing to help them. The Guardian's office, I guess, had a problem with her doing that. From what I'd understand from mom, she would make income and she would use that money to go out and she would tour all the other Scientology missions you know, and do lectures on Scientology to help bring people into those missions to expand the reach of of all Scientology. And from that, she would also recruit people to come and work at her celebrity center, and she would also talk to celebrities. She would do little, she'd sit the celebrities down and, and orient them on different little drills or pieces of Scientology that she felt if they applied it to themselves, it could help them better in their career. So she had her hands in a lot of different pies, but the Guardian's office seemed to think that she was stepping on their toes by dealing with government officials. So they may have felt that they, she was bypassing them. Yeah, or, you know, it could even have been that she might find out that they were committing all these crimes. Oh, <laughs> yeah. She, you know? Yeah. I mean, she, I didn't know the GO was committing all of these crimes, and I was right there with Hubbard. And as I said in the other interview, you know, when he and Mary Sue were, would be having meals together, if a messenger walked in, she would immediately be quiet and stop saying what she was saying. So I always wondered, well, what is she telling him that she wouldn't want us to hear? Guardian's was, office stuff. Yes. Yes. Um, in 1955, L. Ron Hubbard created Project Celebrity. And, you know, he mentioned Scientology or um, celebrities of his period, like Walter Winchell, and you can read the list online, right? Right. But Hubbard actually created a flag order that Diana Hubbard wrote for the... I'll read it. It says, the exact purpose of Celebrity Center is to help LRH sell and deliver high standard Dianetics and Scientology services to celebrities and thus convert Earth's top strata of beings into Scientologists. Unquote. So this is a very, you know, straightforward thing. The way your mother's executing it is beautifully done. It's a lot of affinity for celebrities. Uh, like John Travolta has talked about how, how, how it helped him. And even Tom Cruise came in through a mission, but in Sherman Oaks, into the Celebrity Center. So right. your, mo your mother obviously creates a very successful intake system for existing stars, like I remember there was Karen Black and Chick Corea, Stanley Clark were the early, some of the early celebrities. And, and, and John Travolta, he was one of them. Yeah, John Travolta, thank you. So your mother's really doing something to make Scientology happen in Hollywood. The Guardian's office feels that she's at cross purposes. When does Hubbard step in to this scene to do anything? He doesn't really step in on it. Uh, it, no. it continued to the day she died. Really? So, so really, she, your mother was sort of trying to be a goodwill ambassador for Scientology, and a lot of celebrities were coming in. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a happening place. I remember Celebrity Center was a very happening place in Los Angeles. Right. And your mother was a very well beloved figure. Right. And you know, in nineteen nineteen seventy seven. I think it was, yeah, early 77, an evaluation was done on Celebrity Center. The information for that evaluation was all supplied by the Guardian's office. Mm -hmm. And that evaluation was sent up to Hubbard, and he looked at it, and that's when he said that one person cannot face inward and outward doing the PR and also running the org. So he, he said to separate it out to a, a CO, a commanding officer, and a president so that one handles the celebrities and one handles the running of the org. And based off this information, she, ended, she was removed from post and 
told to create a public relations organization instead to work with all the celebrities and leave CC to to keep doing the service to celebrities. Well, she was sent out there with no financial backing, no organization. Her 200 staff were still all over at CC, and she was kind of just abandoned, I would say. I think that was the start of her, go, her getting sick. Yeah, your mother worked insanely long hours. Yes. And, and she, begins, she begins to become ill. Do you know that your mother's becoming sick? No, I, I don't find out till well after that. But this this all happened when she got sick. She was in the PR organization. She was no longer Celebrity Center had been taken away from her. That was her baby, and had been taken away from her. And she was given a little office in the Firefield Manor, where Celebrity Center is now, and basically told go get some more celebrities and bring them in. But, but she had very little financial or staff backing. So that she was put in an impossible situation. Yes. And I, personally, I believe that was right there was probably the start of her getting sick and going downhill because it was that same year where she went on a tour to Mexico on a, and she was down there on her 50th birthday and she had a stroke and was sent back to L.A., by herself, and I remember Pak Wiltari telling me when he picked her up from the airport, she was slurring her words and couldn't move her left arm, and no one gave her any medical attention. So she has a stroke in Mexico on her 50th birthday. They put her back on a plane, and they don't get her to a hospital? No. No. And then she's left in her room, and my sister actually got a phone call telling her that her Mother was deathly ill, and no one planned to tell her about it. So my sister, who happened to be in L.A., went over to my mom's um, place at the Wilcox and found her delirious in a room and immediately called a hospital and got her taken to hospital. And that's where they found she had two brain tumors. Thank God for the kindness of strangers. That, that's how we found how Alexander had died. So right. someone, someone told your sister anonymously that your mother was very ill. Yes. And that someone knew they had to be quiet or they could be declared. Uh, I, I don't know who that person was or what they were thinking. Just the gratitude, you know, that you have at least for the kindness of strangers. Yes. We did, when we didn't know who Aaron Smith Levin was when he Facebooked Karen and said Alexander Jench died. Wow. We didn't know who, I had never heard of Aaron. I didn't know him. And he said, please keep my name secret. I, right. I, have, I have to keep my name out of that. Aaron was still in. And the gratitude we had toward this stranger we didn't know at the time. We've since got to know very well. He's a very dear friend and his wife and family. Right. This is Scientology in essence because it's, it's bad PR if somebody is sick especially someone with who is as well loved as your mother and and yet it also shows in Scientology if you weaken God help you because you're no longer productive correct you you're considered um, degraded or downstat and you're just a waste of time that's the that's the thought that they have because the body is, you know, as a body, that's not who you are. What attention did your mother get once they discovered she had two brain tumors? Well, then she was sent to Clearwater to get auditing, not medical treatment. And she arrived in Clearwater and was, I don't know, let me think here. It was, she had the stroke in October, late October, and by January 23rd, she was dead. That is fast. Yes. Where did she physically die at? Did she die here in Los Angeles? No, she she died in Clearwater. She, when she went to Clearwater, they did further testing there and found she now had three tumors in her head. So it was just it was just kind of one of those aggressive, very fast tumors. 
I can assume that. I don't know if maybe they missed it in Los Angeles or or if it grew in that short time period. I don't know. Even today, um, Senator McCain's dealing with a very fast, aggressive type of brain cancer. Right. And the fact that they they could find it, but they wouldn't get chemo or radiation or any kind of treatment. So she was just basically put in a room and left to die? From what I was told, yes. And the, the tumor was inoperable. Is what, mm. it, that's what I was told. But, yeah, she was pretty much uh, left in a room with no real care or anything. And then, again, my sister somehow found out again that she wasn't being cared for and got herself a flight and got there, got to the airport in Tampa and called her and she could tell she was like getting in a delirious state and Terry's like, hang on mom, I'm, I'm on my way, I'm nearly there. And when she got there, she again had to call 911 and get an ambulance and get her to the hospital. What happens on this trip to the hospital? Well, she ends up dying in the hospital. Oh, so she died in the hospital in Clearwater. Yes. Did Terry call you to tell you that mom had died? We didn't have phones at the base, so there was no way for Terry to call. A telex was sent to us. Where were you physically at when you found out your mother died? Oh, my brother and I were in La Quinta. So you're with L. Ron Hubbard? Yes. And you get the news from your sister Terry, who's in Clearwater? Uh, actually, it came from um, David Mayo. He, he sent a telex to um, Hubbard to let him know. And um, then Hubbard told Qual to get my brother and I in session. And so we're informed that she's dead and then taken in session as if that's to handle it for us. That was the actual handling, put them in session? Yeah, to audit the loss. Your mother was so devoted to Ron Hubbard. Does he come to, to, to tell you and your brother he's very sorry for your loss? No. I mean, is a memorial held for Yvonne? The, you know, we, my brother and I flew to Clearwater, and a, memori a private memorial was held there because they didn't want the word out until they wanted to put a team together and fire out a mission to go and deal with each of the celebrities on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So they didn't want to put word out, and they didn't do a big memorial service or maybe the mission did, I'm, I'm not sure, but we weren't invited. Uh, we did our own family memorial service in Clearwater. And the church, the church is a PR thing, and they're going to handle the news of your mother's death privately with the celebrities who loved her. Right. And they get them in session, and, you know, basically they would say, Yvonne dropped the body, or however Scientology says it. Right. How did you feel about the way your mother was treated and her death? You, what, what emotional state were you in? Um, very grief-stricken. Yeah, did you feel betrayed by your church? I felt totally betrayed from every single angle with, with how dedicated she was and her having been kept separate from her kids and me, us not being a part of it or being informed of what was going on. In fact, I'd actually gotten a letter with, with lines in her letters or missing words, and I went to my, my boss, Annie, and I said, hey, is my mom sick? There's missing words in this letter. And uh, she, she was telling me, no, she's totally fine. This is Annie Kidman. Yeah, yeah. So they're lying to you about your mother, so you'll keep your production in. Right. Janice, how is death treated in Scientology in general? Like you mentioned earlier that you're, you're not your body, you're a Satan. Right. But when it really happens, I mean, you, the love you felt for your mother, the, the grief, the betrayal, you're, you're not allowed to talk about it or really handle it or process it, are you? No, 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 he's got to... You're only supposed to handle it or deal with it in session. Otherwise, if if you're on the job and you're crying, that's considered case on post. And that's an ethics offense because it's thought that 
bodies are related, but Thetans are not related. Therefore, and we're all just using bodies as an identity. And so if a body dies, it dies. You're still connected as a Thetan in the Theta world. So there's very, very little consideration given to family members involved in grief. You know, it's more of, well, as a Thetan, you need to deal with those emotions. But don't let it get in the way of your job. And, uh, you know, this, this whole thing with my mother's death, there's, there's more to it that I cover in my second book that's coming out. If we can just leave it at that, and I'll, I'll yeah, go yeah, into I, more I, detail. Yeah, I understand because, you know, a, a, a podcast, Janice, can always do the, the justice a book can do where you really get into the details. But I did want to at least make our listeners aware of, of the high personal price you and your brother and sister paid to right. serve in the Sea Org. Right, and I, and I appreciate that. I do agree yeah. with what you're doing, yes. And I can really empathize with having lost your mother that way. So how, how do you get on with life in the sea or with all these feelings? You just have to stuff them down inside? Yeah, you stuff them down inside and you quietly cry yourself to sleep. And you can't talk about it because it's weakness. Right. So, so your, your mother dies. What was the date she, she died on? Uh, January 23rd, 1978. And you have to go back to La Quinta to, to, as a messenger for L. Ron Hubbard. Right. So, yeah, my brother and I took three days off to go down there. And I remember when I was telling Hubbard that I was leaving to go to my mother's memorial service, he was like, why? Really? Yeah, he, he was surprised that I was going for that. And I'm like, well, it's my mother. That had to just be jaw-dropping to have Hubbard say why. Yes, it was. Because the implication is, well, you're needed here. Yes. Mike Render, when he was early in his Sea Org career married, they, he, he and his wife lost a child. Correct. And Mike wanted to go to be with his family and the memorial, and David Miscavige wouldn't let him go. Right, yeah. And that's, this whole thing, Miscavige seems to be a big pusher of it, too, these days. On the, even with this whole thing on disconnection, it's like, you're not really related. It's just a body, you know. So if you can move on. There's a Thetan, and they'll come back. So they're not really lost because they'll come back in a new body. Yes, and Hubbard, didn't he teach that the body's just run by a low-level organism called the genetic entity? Yeah. And so this genetic entity would be be like some automaton running the body. The Satan could depart, and really the body's just the genetic entity, so move on with life. Correct. Well, well when you come back from Clearwater and, and the private memorial for your mother, Production has to go on. What, what do you get into? What's the scene at that time? Well, I go back onto my messenger watches with Hubbard. And, um, you know, wherever he went, I went. We were shooting film at the time. Or, you know, I'd take dictation. He would dictate to us directly into a typewriter. I would sit there and type while he's dictating to us. Yeah, life just went back to normal. And this is in the aftermath of the FBI raid on Scientology in July of 1977. So Hubbard's still dealing with the, the fallout of the FBI raids from Program Snow White. Yeah, because he came back. We talked about him being in Sparks, and he came back. I'm, my memory is the 5th of January, 1978, he came back. And so within... Um, 15, 17 days, you know, my mother's dead, and um, life just kept going along. And so my mother dies in January of 78, and I'm supposed to just keep operating as if nothing has happened. And then I start my book out, my book, Commodore's Messenger, A Child Adrift in the Scientology Sea Org. I start my book out with the first chapter of what happened in May of that year. So you're talking 
four months after my mother passed, I'm actually held in captivity, which furthers the whole betrayal. L. Ron Hubbard himself ordered you to be sex-checked and held in captivity. Well, he ordered me to be sex-checked. I don't know who ordered me to be held, but I know he knew about it because after I'd been in there for 11 days, it was a Mary Sue wrote me a letter. And the only way Mary Sue would have known is if he had told her. Well, now, at this point, are, are L. Ron Hubbard and Mary Sue still living together? No, Mary Sue had moved to L.A. She had moved to Los Angeles before he had come back from Sparks. He would not come back until she had left the base because he didn't want to be in the same location as her because of the FBI raid and, and what the G.O. had done. Yeah, and she, she would uh, later be indicted. Right. And it's, what did you think, just on a human level, L. Ron Hubbard distances himself from, from Mary Sue? Well, you got to realize when you're in there, you're not on a human level. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're you're so um, well. Point taken. I, I I take your point. You're you you have you're you're trying to salvage the planet or, or right. whatever it is. And so you're not allowed to be emotional about anything. You you don't even think of the family relationship or anything like that because it's. The whole purpose is to clear the planet and make it a better planet, but here you are with your own think is messed up. You're so brainwashed. Yeah, you are You are literally trapped. You get sex checked per Hubbard's orders. I mean, you don't know where you stand with R. on Hubbard or with the church. Is David Miscavige still in the Senate unit at this time, or is he coming into power? No, uh, at that time he was... Um, doing video camera work as a messenger. He occasionally he would stand he'd stand messenger watches. Now just on a side question, Shelley Miscavige, the the missing wife of David Miscavige, you knew you knew Shelley Barnett before she married David. Oh yeah, I knew Shelley back on the ship when she came. Now Shelley was CMO, correct? Yes. And were you at the base when when Shelley and, and David Miscavige get married? You know, I, I can't remember the wedding, so I'm thinking I must have been off on a mission or something when they got married. Yeah, but they, they got married pretty young, didn't they? Yeah. Yes, they did. Janice, what happens after your sex checks? Do you get put back on post? No, that's when um, I got assigned to the uh, RPF, the Rehabilitation Project Force, which means basically you're separated from the group, you do m heavy manual labor, and you're supposed to do Scientology training and auditing five hours a day while you're, while you're working within this group of people where you have to run everywhere that you go, you have to call everybody, sir, you can't eat with the crew anymore or even originate communication to them. You have to wait, let them originate to you. It, it, to me, it was, I hated it. It was like a prison. But you then, once you're in it and you, find, and you ex finally accept, you, you get yourself brainwashed and you put yourself in that mode of, okay, let me just buckle down and do this. Then you have those fun moments, you know, John Brousseau, who... A lot of people know of John. He was on the RPF with me, and we used to have fun having um, paint fights, building movie sets. <laughs> and, you know, so it's like there are those fun moments while you're going through hell. Yeah, fun like when you're in prison. <laughs> uh, but but you, there, is some, there is some camaraderie, and, and John Bursos is a very good man. I, I'm right. so glad that he... He left and spoke out. How long were you in RPF, and when did you get out? When well, you uh, I went from May to probably about September when it was decided that it must have been all wrong, that all these people, all these good executives would list one RSs. And so that's when I got out. You were, you were actually a list one rock slammer? Well, that's what they, well, I wasn't, but that's what I was being accused of being. <laughs> Yeah, and that was in that period where a lot of Sea Org members were List One Rock Slammers. Conveniently up here in L.A., it's when they bought 
packed base and it needed a lot of renovation. Yes. And, and, and people online joke about it, kind of gallows humor about, oh, how convenient they need a huge, cheap, free labor force. And right. Certainly everyone's a list. Now, what is a list one rock slammer? That Scientology language is for our audience. Yeah, um, list one is a list that Hubbard did up, which lists out things like L. Ron Hubbard, Mary Sue Hubbard, Scientology, Dianetics, Auditing, and, and so it's like that's called list one. And a rock slam is where the e meter, the needle is slamming back and forth, and uncontrollable, which is said to indicate evil purposes. So to be a list one RS, or it's considered that you have evil purposes against whatever item it was on that list. On that list, so I was being told I had evil purposes on Mary Sue Hubbard. You know, of all the messengers, I was I was the messenger that got along best with her. And even when I was getting married, and she was she was in L.A. and she was still going through all her guardian stuff. She took the time to go and get me a wedding gift and mail it to me and send me a nice little card. You know, so I had a decent decent rapport with her. And I always knew, I'm like, I don't have any evil purpose against her. But that's what they were saying, so that's why I was sent there. Because the meter knows all and sees all inside of yeah. Scientology. Yeah. It's viewed as being infallible. And it, it is true that they... Uh, but, they believe that about the meter. They also use it as a lie detector, but they also weaponize it. The e-meter can be misused. They can use it to find whatever they want, basically. Right, and, and a lot of people, they believe and depend on the e-meter rather than themselves. You know what's right. You know what you're thinking. You know if you're evil or not. You don't sure. need an e-meter to tell you that. Unless you've been indoctrinated. Right. So, yeah, and so when you're indoctrinated, you believe in everything that that meter is, is telling you or that auditor is telling you. And that auditor might not even know how to read the e-meter in the first place. True. It depends on the competence of, of the auditor. Correct. But putting, putting things together, your mother dies in January 1978. You're RPF'd in May. You get out around September. So 1978 was a year of hell for you. Yeah. And what happens? You get out of RPF and you go back on post? Yeah, I went back on my messenger watches with Hubbard and he acted as if nothing had ever happened. Didn't that anger you? <laughs> um, no, because I, I, you, you, don't, you don't think that way when you're in there. Mm. Well, what do you think? You just, I, I was just happy to be out of, out of the RPF and back to normal and to have friends again and to yeah. wear clean clothes. Yeah, I could see that if you were in the, it, it, is, it is a big welcome relief. Yeah, so. You, so you don't get into the, you know, look, oh, you don't get into being a victim. Mm. You, just, you just move on. And that helps you survive by just moving on. Yeah, you just move on. You just don't think of the... It, it, Hey, I'm a victim. Look what was done to me. You don't. Do, I don't even go there. I yeah. I just great. I'm out. Let me keep going. Janice, there's so much to talk about, but I'd like to, as we near the end, I have to ask you about a story I've read on the internet for a long time, and if you will indulge me and our listeners, there's a story online about a scene that happens out in the desert where somebody goes to make a call on a payphone, and David Miscavige and his uh, hoodlums show up and destroy the payphone out in the middle of the desert. Correct. What happened in this? This is a great story. Could you give us the setup and what happened? Yeah, you know, I wasn't there for all of it, but what had happened was Gail was the commanding officer of the Commodore's Messenger Organization, and David had been assigned special projects and he was to report only to Pat Broker and Hubbard. And David had already had a personal relationship with Pat, and I think it was something they probably worked out between themselves. So David was autonomous and no longer under the control of the commanding officer of the CMO. And Gail, as the commanding officer, felt David 
was getting too power hungry and out of control. And so she decides to go and get a hold of Pat Broker because she had no command over David anymore. Was David the action chief at this point? No. No? No, he was special. He was special project. He was assigned to just do certain things that Pat or Hubbard told him to do. So he had no accountability except to Pat or Hubbard. Right. He had been at action. But, yeah, so he, his only accountability was to Pat or to Hubbard, no one else. And Gail felt he was getting out of control. And so Gail decided she was going to call Pat and talk to Pat about it. So she got John Brissot to, I, I believe it was John Brissot, she had drive her to a certain payphone, and she got a message to Pat to call that payphone. And DM, meanwhile, found out Gail had gone, and he actually put his fist through the wall, because that's how I found out about it. I walked into an office, I'm like, how did this hole get here? <laughs> and I was told, Dave put his fist through the wall. Anyway, um, from what I was told, Dave showed up with a bunch of uh, big guys and basically threw Gail into the van while she was waiting for the call back from Pat and took like a crowbar out of the van and bashed the payphone so that no call could come through to Gail. Jesus, that is really something. So from, from early on, David Miscavige has a violent temper. Yes, definitely. And, and this has been the consistent testimony of Sea Org members who worked closely with David Miscavige. And no matter how much the church tries to deny it or lie about it, he has a very bad temper, lack of impulse control. He has hit people, broken things. Janice, was David Miscavige always violent or did that come when he came into power? What was your experience of him prior to him going upwards the ranks? When I think back to when he was younger and before he was in a position of power, you know, I used to take liberties with him. We used to joke around together. We used to even wrestle together. I never saw that side of him. You could see he, he had a driving force behind him. He's always had that. And if he wants something, he will just nag and nag and nag and nag until he got his way. But I never saw the real violent side of him. And even afterwards, I've heard of the violent, but I, I, and I've seen him explode. But that was when he was in a position of power. But before he was in a position of power, I was senior to him. And so he didn't treat me that way you know, under those circumstances, it was when he got into a position of power that he became more, he became very ruthless. And, mm. and that is so what Scientology never was to me. In my head, my thoughts of what Scientology was, was not about being ruthless. But though I'd see Hubbard being ruthless, you know, but to me it was like, wait a minute, where's the granting of beingness? Where's the working to help people? And that's, you know, that's when you're so brainwashed, you don't see straight. I can understand that. And this is why I'm glad you're, you're writing your book. And we'll do another interview down the road because I, your books two and three, your, all your trilogy of books you're writing, your first one is out, form such an important contribution to the history of Scientology. And, and, I'm, and I'm glad you wrote them and appreciate you coming on the show talking about these things. Janice, one question I, I ask periodically to people, and you're, you're someone I want to ask, a lot of people who are still in the Church of Scientology who are under the radar, Yes. they listen, they, they listen to my podcast. For people who are in the Church wrestling with their commitment to Scientology, and they're good people, what, what would you say to them? Oh, wow. Well, yeah, that's a heated question. <laughs> Tell you what, my my dad was in there and we were out and we were disconnected from him. He quietly would come and visit us. He kept that under the radar that he was seeing us. It was my talking out on the internet and my brother talking to the press that resulted in my father being called into um, ethics 
and being given a little program to come and handle my brother and I to basically shut us up. Hmm. And so when he came out to handle us, what happened was we ended up showing him all the evidence and telling him what was really going on and opening up his eyes to the truth. And he ended up joining us and not going back. And that's a great story, and that's what Leah has emphasized, is that families can leave together. Right. It's better, better to stay together as a family because love is much more powerful than Scientology. Right. And when you're in Scientology, you can't see that. You think the group is greater than anything when, in fact, love and the power of family, forgiveness, things like that are much, much more powerful. But those are hard lessons to learn when you, you think you're searching for the ultimate truths of the universe and you're willing to overlook so much. Yeah, you get to the point and you sacrifice in order to and think that that's your eternity. And it does take a lot of courage to leave and speak out, and I admire you and, and your sister and brother for doing it. I met your father. He's a wonderful man. Yes. Just a wonderful man. Yes. And you, your family... It's just you come from a wonderful family, you're all good people, and you found your way out of the Church of Scientology. Janice, thank you so much for your time today. As always, it's a pleasure to talk to you. You're welcome. And the book, again, is called Commodore's Messenger, A Child Adrift in the Scientology Sea Organization by Janice Gillum Grady, who's been our guest. For Surviving Scientology Radio, this is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. And as always, we'll be in very good touch. Thank you for listening.